Hey, good morning, y'all. Welcome to the Valley Labor Report. My name is Adam Keller, and this is Shop Talk, our Thursday morning episode we're producing with a focus on labor education, history, and training. It's Thursday, July 13th, and we're broadcasting from Spice Radio Studio in the heart of the Tennessee Valley in Huntsville, Alabama. Every episode is live streamed on YouTube and Facebook and is released on your favorite podcasting platform in the coming days. Today on the show, as we typically do for the first episode of each month, I'll be sharing the important anniversaries in this month in working class history. Before I do that, I want to take a moment to thank our very first sponsor for Shop Talk. At the Valley Labor Report, we are big fans of Labor Notes. Labor Notes is a media and organizing project that since 1979 has been the voice of union activists who want to put the movement back in the labor movement. Through their magazine, website, books, conferences, and workshops, Labor Notes promotes organizing, aggressive strategies to fight concessions, alliances with worker centers, and unions that are run by their members. Labor Notes is also a network of rank-and-file members, local union leaders, and labor activists who know the labor movement is worth fighting for. They encourage connections between workers in different unions, worker centers, communities, industries, and countries to strengthen the movement from the bottom up. With 40 years of movement building behind them, Labor Notes exists as a resource for leaders and union members who want to chart a new course for the labor movement. At the Valley Labor Report, we are both uh, proud subscribers and supporters. We encourage our listeners to follow suit. Go to labornotes.org to find out more. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. I do apologize that last week we were unable to have an episode. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, and this week I am pre-recording this uh, segment just to be able to make sure that it actually happens today on time. Uh, so we've had a lot of interruptions this summer, and, and I'll talk more about that uh, probably Saturday and as well uh, moving forward about the schedule for Shop Talk and uh, some other updates. But I uh, really appreciate everyone tuning in this morning. And like I said, because we weren't able to do an episode last month, we still need to do July Labor History. We need to look at the important anniversaries in labor history and the long fight for justice in July. So uh, that's what we're going to do this morning. And I compiled this information primarily from the 2022-23 edition of Planning to Change the World, a plan book for social justice educators. This excellent planner is published by the Education for Liberation Network, and I want to make sure I give them full credit. Shout out as well to the Zen Education Project, which is another great resource. Check out their This Day in History post on social media, as well as that section on their website. And finally, the Labor Tribune of St. Louis and Southern Illinois at labortribune.com was also a helpful source. Now, I won't pretend this is an exhaustive list of working class history anniversaries in July, but we'll mention quite a few important and interesting events in the history of the South, our labor movement, and our working class. So let's get started. On July 1, 1929, more than 1,000 streetcar workers went on strike in New Orleans. Lasting four months, this is considered to be the last in an era of streetcar strikes. When scabs were brought in from New York, many in New Orleans rallied to support the strikers, including former streetcar workers and union members Clovis and Benjamin Martin, who owned a small restaurant. They provided free sandwiches to the Poe Boys on strike. It is said that this is where the Poe Boy sandwich name began. Also on July 1st, but in 1956, in what was to be a month-long strike, 650,000 steelworkers shut down the industry while demanding a number of wage and working conditions improvements. They won all of their demands, including a union shop. On July 2, 1964, President Johnson signed Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, which forbid employers and unions from discriminating based on race, color, gender, nationality, or religion. Also on July 2nd, just two years ago in 2021, due to overwhelming opposition from activists and community members, construction of the Bahalia Connection oil pipeline in Greater Memphis, Tennessee, was canceled by its developers, Plains All-American Pipeline. So good job to our activist siblings to the northwest of us. 
On July 3, 1835, 2,000 workers, most of whom were children, went on strike from 20 textile mills in Patterson, New Jersey, to demand better work hours in what was known as the Patterson Silt Workers' Strike. Workers had previously been forced to work 13 hours per day, Monday through Saturday, and were regularly fined for minor disciplinary infractions. Although the strike was eventually broken, the company decreased workers' hours to 12 hours during the week and 9 hours on Saturday. July 4th was, of course, U.S. Independence Day. On July 4th, 1776, the 13 American colonies formally declared independence from Great Britain. May all Americans have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. July 5th, 1934, was the West Coast Longshoremen Strike, Battle of Rincon Hill, San Francisco. Some 5,000 strikers fought 1,000 police, scabs, and National Guardsmen. Two strikers were killed. Over 100 people were injured. The incident, forever known as Bloody Thursday, led to a general strike throughout the city of San Francisco. Also on July 5th, one year later in 1935, the National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA or Wagner Act, was signed into law. One of the clauses states, quote, employees shall have the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing, and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid and prote protection. Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins, having personally witnessed workers jump to their death during the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire, played a major role in getting the legislation passed. While this was an advance, the struggle for the right to organize continued and does continue to this day. July 6, 1892, the Homestead Strike. On July 6, 1892, there was a major pitched battle during the Homestead Strike between the Pinkerton Detective Agency and striking steelworkers. Carnegie Steel was engaged in an all-out campaign to break the steelworkers' union. And I'm going to quote here from Howard Zinn in Chapter 11 of A People's History of the United States. Quote, In early 1892, the Carnegie Steel plant at Homestead, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh, was being managed by Henry Clay Frick while Carnegie was in Europe. Frick de decided to reduce the workers' wages and break their union. He built a fence three miles long and 12 feet high around the steelworks and topped it with barbed wire adding peepholes for rifles. When the workers did not accept the pay cut, Frick laid off the entire workforce. The Pinkerton Detective Agency was hired to protect strike breakers. Although only 750 of the 3,800 workers at Homestead belonged to the union, 3,000 workers met in the Opera House and voted overwhelmingly to strike. The plant was on the river, and a thousand pickets began patrolling a 10-mile stretch of the river. A committee of strikers took over the town, and the sheriff was unable to raise a posse among local people against them. On the night of July 5, 1892, hundreds of Pinkerton guards boarded barges five miles down the river from Homestead and moved toward the plant, where 10,000 strikers and sympathizers waited. The crowd warned the Pinkertons not to step off the barge. A striker lay down on the gangplank, and when a Pinkerton man tried to shove him aside, he fired wounding the detective in the thigh. In the gunfire that followed on both sides, seven workers were killed. The Pinkertons had to retreat onto the barges. They were attacked from all sides, voted to surrender, and then were beaten by the enraged crowd. They were dead on both sides. For the next several days, the strikers were in command of the area. Now the state went into action. The governor brought in the militia, armed with the latest rifles and Gatling guns, to protect the import of strike breakers. Strike leaders were charged with murder. 160 other strikers were tried for other crimes. All were acquitted by friendly juries. The entire strike committee was then arrested for treason against the state, but no jury would convict them. The strike held for four months, but the plant was producing steel with strike breakers who were brought in, often in locked trains, not knowing their destination, not knowing a strike was on. The strikers, with no resources left, agreed to return to work, their leaders blacklisted. 
One reason for the defeat was that the strike was confined to Homestead and other plants of Carnegie kept working. Some blast furnace workers did strike, but they were quickly defeated, and the pig iron from those furnaces was then used at Homestead. The defeat kept unionization from the Carnegie plants well into the 20th century, and the workers took wage cuts and increases in hours without organized resistance. Again, that was from Chapter 11 of A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. So July 7th is the 120th anniversary of the March of the Mill Children. Mary Harris, Mother Jones, began a three-week march from Philadelphia to Oyster Bay, New York, site of President Theodore Roosevelt's Long Island summer home, to bring attention to the public to the, str the struggle of child labor. The march was organized alongside striking child and adult textile workers. The goal was to limit the work week to 55 hours and ban night work for women and children. At the time, it was the largest strike in Philadelphia history. The March for Children's Rights raised awareness across North America and contributed to the passage of the first child labor laws. And I want to highlight this quote from Mother Jones. I asked the newspaper men why they didn't publish the facts about child labor in Pennsylvania. They said they couldn't because the mill owners had stock in the papers. Well, I've got stock in these little children, said I, and I'll arrange a little publicity. And that's exactly what she did. During the march, Jones delivered her, fam her famous The Well of the Children speech. Here are a few excerpts. After a long and weary march with more miles to travel, we are on our way to see President Roosevelt at Oyster Bay. We will ask him to recommend the passage of a bill by Congress to protect children against the greed of the manufacturer. We want him to hear the wail of the children, who never have a chance to go to school, but work from 10 to 11 hours a day in the textile mills of Philadelphia, weaving the carpets that he and you walk on, and the curtains and the clothes of the people. In Georgia, where children work day and night in the cotton mills, they have just passed a bill to protect songbirds. What about the little children from whom all song is gone? The trouble is that the fellers in Washington don't care. I saw them last winter pass three railroad bills in one hour, but when labor cries for aid for the little ones, they turn their backs and will not listen to her. I asked a man in prison once how he happened to get there. He had stolen a pair of shoes. I told him that if he had stolen a railroad, he could be a United States senator. One hour of justice is worth an age of praying. And for the record, President Teddy Roosevelt did refuse to see the marchers. July 8th is the 125th anniversary of the annexation of Hawaii. On July 8th, 1898, the final signature was attached to the Newlands Resolution annexing Hawaii to the United States. This despite the fact that the opposition was made clear in the petitions against annexation signed by more than half of the Hawaiian population. Who was in favor of annexation? Well, just look at who was named governor of the newly annexed islands by President McKinley. Sanford B. Dole. Yes, the fruit company guy. July 8, 1966, some 35,000 members of the Machinist Union began what is to become a 43-day strike that shut down five major U.S. airlines, about three-fifths of domestic air traffic. The airlines were thriving and wages were a key issue in the fight. On July 9, 1868, the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution was adopted, overruling the Dred Scott v. Sanford decision. The amendment also known as the Reconstruction Amendment, granted citizen citizenship to, quote, all persons born or naturalized in the United States. The 14th Amendment forbid states to deny any person life, liberty, or property without due process of law, or to, not, to deny any person equal protection of the laws. On July 9, 2001, 5,000 demonstrators rallied at the state capitol in Columbia, South Carolina, in support of the Charleston Five. Labor activists charged with a felony rioting during a police attack on, two, on a 2,000 longshoremen's picket, picket of a non-union crew that was unloading a ship. On July 11, 1892, 
Union miners in Idaho used dynamite to explode the barracks housing agents from the Pinkerton National Detective Agency who had infiltrated the union and were providing union information to the mine owners. I wanted to pass along this recommendation on this subject from the Zen Education Project. Uh, there is a young adult historical fiction novel called Fire in the Hole by Mary Cronk Farrell. And readers learn just how desperate the conditions were for mining families, how the company unfairly detained citizens for very long periods of time, uh, as compared to, a, to Guantanamo Bay for miners at this time. And uh, also, the, the novel explores how African-American troops were sent by the federal government to restore order. Uh, so again, that, that young adult novel is Fire in the Hole. Sounds really interesting. I haven't read it, but I wanted to pass along that, res uh, that recommendation. On July 11, 1983, a nine-year strike began at the Ohio Crankshaft Division of Park Ohio Industries in Cleveland. Overcoming scabs, arrests, and firings, UAW Local 91 members hung on and approved a contract in 1992 with the company, which was then under new management. That included company-funded health and retirement benefits as well as pay increases. Wow, that is quite the long struggle. Nearly 10 years to get your contract. July 12, 1917 was the Bisbee de deportation. The Bisbee deportation was the illegal deportation of more than 1,000 striking mine workers led by the IWW, their supporters, and citizen bystanders by 2,000 vigilantes. The University of Arizona Archives provides some background on the strike. On June 24, 1917, the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, presented the Bisbee, Arizona mining companies with a list of demands. These demands included improvements to safety and working conditions, such as requiring two men on each machine and an end to blasting in the mines during shifts. Demands were also made to end discrimination against members of labor organizations and the unequal treatment of foreign and minority workers. Furthermore, the unions wanted a flat wage system to replace sliding scales tied to the market price of copper. The copper companies refused all IWW demands using the war effort as justification. As a result, a strike was called, and by June 27th, roughly half of the Bisbee workforce was on strike. On July 12, 1917, the striking workers and others were kidnapped and held at a local baseball park. They were then loaded onto cattle cars and transported 200 miles for 16 hours through the desert without food or water. The deportees were unloaded at Hermanas, New Mexico, without money or transportation, and warned not to return to Bisbee. On July 12, 1933, the Screen Actors Guild held its very first meeting, and among those attending was the future horror movie star and union activist Boris Karloff, who played Frankenstein's monster. Uh, worth noting that the Screen Actors Guild contract actually expired just last night at midnight. July 12. July 13, 1934, Southern Tenant Farmers Union was organized in Tyronza, Arkansas. Also on July 13, it is the 160th anniversary of the New York draft riots. It was an uprising by primarily Irish immigrants to protest the Conscription Act of 1863, which allowed the rich to pay $300 to avoid military service. Unfortunately, the uprisings turned into an explosion of anti-black rage. Over three days, up to 1,200 people were killed, and the city's orphanage for black children was burned to the ground. An estimated 3,000 black folks were left homeless. By every measure, it remains the worst riot in U.S. history. July 14th is, of course, Bastille Day, commemorating the storming of the Bastille, which was a political prison in Paris, on July 14, 1789, which ultimately launched the French Revolution, which itself would ultimately take down the long-running Bourbon dynasty and create the first of several French republics. And also, July 14, 1912, was the birthday of the great Woody Guthrie, who wrote such songs as Union Made and This Land is Your Land. 
July 15th is the 50th anniversary of the longest walk. On July 15, 1978, a peaceful transcontinental trek for Native American justice, which had begun with a few hundred people departing Alcatraz Island, California, ended on this day when they arrived in Washington, D.C., accompanied by 30,000 marchers. They were calling attention to the ongoing problems plaguing Indian communities, such as lack of jobs, housing, health care, as well as dozens of pieces of legislation before Congress canceling treaty obligations of the U.S. government towards various Indian tribes. The longest walk was intended to symbolize the forced removal of American Indians from their homelands and to draw attention to the continuing problems of Indian people in their communities. The event was also intended to expose and challenge the backlash movement against Indian treaty rights that was gaining strength around the country and in Congress. This backlash could be seen in the growing number of bills before Congress to abrogate Indian treaties and restrict Indian rights. Sending my love and solidarity to all of our indigenous communities. July 15, 1931. Ralph Gray, an African-American sharecropper and leader of the Sharecroppers Union, was murdered in Camp Hill, Alabama. Also on July 15th, but in 1959, a half million steelworkers began what is to become a 116-day strike that shuttered nearly every steel mill in the country. Management wanted to dump contract language limiting its ability to change the number of workers assigned to a task or to introduce new work rules or machinery that would result in reduced hours or fewer employees. On July 16, 1920, martial law was declared in a strike by longshoremen in Galveston, Texas. July 17, 1944 was the Port Chicago disaster and mutiny. On July 17, 1944, a deadly munitions explosion occurred at the Port Chicago Naval Magazine in Port Chicago, California. As a result of the disaster, 320 men died, two-thirds of whom were African American. 200 African American men protested, and 50 of them faced court-martial and jail for challenging these despicable working conditions. This is a key story in World War II and Jim Crow history. On July 18, 1899, was the Newsboy Strike in New York. The once forgotten, now famous New York Newsboy Strike of 1899 started on July 18 when newsies in Long Island City, Queens, caught the evening journal delivery man selling them short bundles. They tipped over his wagon, chased him up the street, and triumphantly carried off armloads of paper, inspiring what nearly became a children's general strike. Over the next two weeks, boys in all five boroughs and in cities and towns throughout the Northeast refused to sell William Randolph Hearst's Evening Journal and Joseph Pulitzer's New York World, the two largest circulation newspapers in the nation. Their actions emboldened newsboys as far away as Cincinnati, Ohio, Lexington, Kentucky, and Nashville, Tennessee, and boot blacks and messengers in other cities as well. They were inspired to stop work and demand better terms from their own bosses. Far from aberrations, these strikes capped a decade of discontent in the newspaper trade. Time was ripe for a showdown. The revolt in Queens rekindled the boys' discontent over price hikes imposed on them by Hearst and Pulitzer at the start of the Spanish-American War in 1898. It also coincided with a national strike wave, a local heat wave, and a militant protest by streetcar motormen in Brooklyn and Manhattan that kept police tied up. Many working-class children, boys and girls, blocked tracks with debris and threw stones at non-union drivers. Redressing grievances about paying wartime prices for peacetime papers gave Newsies the chance to mobilize on their own behalf. Three hundred of them met in City Hall Park on July 19th and pledged to strike if their demands weren't met. The strikers represented the full range of ages, ethnicities, and disabilities found in the news trade. One of the spokesmen was Kid Blink, a charismatic 18-year-old Italian-American with a bum eye. Dave Simons, also 18, was a Jewish boxing champion and was another leader of the strike. On July 19, 1881, was the Atlanta washerwomen's strike. 
20 laundresses met in Atlanta to form a trade organization called the Washington Society. They sought higher pay, respect, and autonomy over their work and established a uniform rate at $1 per dozen pounds of wash. With the help of black ministers throughout the city, they held a mass meeting and called a strike on July 19th to achieve higher pay at the uniform rate. The Washing Society established door-to-door -door canvassing to widen their membership, urging laundresses across the city to join or at least honor the strike. They also invo involved white laundresses, who were less than 2% of the workers in the city uh, in that particular trade, which was an extraordinary sign of interracial solidarity for the time. In three weeks, the Washington Society grew from 20 to 3,000 strikers. And this was one of the many fantastic stories in Fight Like Hell, which is our dear sister Kim Kelly's great book about the lesser told stories of our labor history. July 20th is the 100th anniversary of the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment in Congress. Three years after women won the right to vote, the ERA was introduced in Congress by Senator Curtis and Representative Anthony, both Republicans. It was authored by Alice Paul, head of the National Women's Party, who was a leader in the suffrage campaign. She had first introduced the amendment in Seneca Falls at the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention. Not surprisingly, perhaps, it is still not the law of the land. July 21st is the 110th anniversary of the Oakley Farm Fire. Through convict leasing, southern states continue to profit from the free labor of incarcerated black people who were subjected to horrific living conditions and brutal physical work requirements. At Oakley Farm, a prison camp in Mississippi, black men were incarcerated in a dilapidated building with no fire escape. When fire broke out, 35 men were trapped on the second floor. All of them perished. For more information about the practice of convict leasing, check out the book or the documentary, Slavery by Another Name. On July 22, 1877, approximately 1,500 rail workers and residents of St. Louis, Missouri, briefly took over the city as part of the wider Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Here is a part of their statement. Whereas the United States government has allied itself on the side of capital and against labor. Therefore, resolved that we, the Working Men's Party of the United States, heartily sympathize with the employees of all the railroads in the country who are attempting to secure just and equitable reward for their labor. Resolved that we will stand by them in this most righteous struggle of labor against robbery and oppression through good and evil report to the end of the struggle. That is from the United States Working Men's Party. To avoid disrupting passenger service but still achieve the goals of the strike, workers continued to operate passenger rail cars, collecting the fares themselves. The strike spread to other sectors in the city, including flour mills and breweries, and bosses across the city agreed to higher wages and shorter work days. These gains were soon lost, however, with the arrival of the U.S. Army and state militia. The strike, which had seemed to be successful, ended when some thousand some 3,000 federal troops and 5,000 deputized special police killed at least 18 people in skirmishes around the city. July 23rd is the 50th anniversary of President Nixon's refusal to release White House tapes in the Watergate investigation. The Watergate scandal refers to a web of illegal and anti-democratic actions taken by President Nixon and his allies and aides to target and harass his political opposition and their efforts to cover up those actions. The Nixon administration was ultimately forced to hand over the tapes of the White House conversations, which included several incriminating pieces of evidence. Nixon eventually resigned the presidency rather than face certain impeachment. I know this is a more political anniversary here, but you know, look around and it's clear that history at least rhymes if not repeats. The labor movement must be at the forefront of the fight for a truly democratic society that is actually of the people, by the people, and for the people. July 24th is the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in Chile. Enslaved Africans were first brought to the Spanish colony that is modern-day Chile in 1536. 
Because the country did not have large-scale cash crop plantations, most enslaved Africans in Chile were forced to work as household domestic workers or as gold and silver miners. Many black people participated in Chile's War of Independence against Spain, which led to the ban on slavery in 1823. Chile was the second country in the Americas after Haiti to abolish slavery. On July 25, 2005, the Teamsters and Service, and Service Employees Unions broke from the AFL-CIO during the Federation's 50th convention to begin their own Change to Win coalition, ultimately, which com was comprised of seven unions, and by 2011 was down to four unions, SEIU, Teamsters, UFCW, and the UFW. On July 26, 1877, in Chicago, 30 workers were killed by federal troops and more than 100 were wounded at the Battle of the Viaduct during the Great Railroad Strike that we mentioned earlier. Also on July 26, 1912, was the Battle of Mucklow, West Virginia during a coal strike. An estimated 100,000 shots were fired with 12 miners and 4 guards killed. July 26, 1992, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, took effect, requiring employers to offer reasonable accommodations to qualified employees with disabilities and banning discrimination against such workers. Obviously, we have much more work to do. July 27th is the 90th anniversary of the Havana bus driver strike. The strike, begun by Havana bus drivers, quickly grew to include workers and students in a general strike encompassing the entire country. Police and the military attacked the unarmed protesters, killing several and injuring many more. This only served to further galvanize them. In less than two weeks, the military had turned against the brutal dictator Gerardo Machado, and his regime collapsed. On July 28, 1932, the U.S. government attacked World War I veterans with tanks, bayonets, and tear gas under the leadership of textbook heroes Douglas MacArthur, George Patton, and Dwight D. Eisenhower. The World War I vets were part of a bonus army of both black and white veterans who came to Washington, D.C. to make a demand for their promised wartime bonuses. July 29, 1970, following a five-year table grape boycott, Delano area growers filed into the United Farm Workers Union Hall in Delano, California to sign their first union contracts. July 30th is the 110th anniversary of the Barcelona textile workers' strike. 20,000 workers, mostly women and children, went on strike against low wages and long hours, particularly night shifts. A union had been formed, but its leadership were all men who dismissed the women and their issues. The strike inspired new levels of consciousness among working-class women. One journalist reported, quote, the spirit of women has spoken with enough eloquence to launch the entire working population. The strike continued all the way until September 15th, when the Catalan governor introduced a 60-hour work week. July 30th, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Social Security Act of 1965, establishing Medicare and Medicaid. July 31st is the 60th anniversary of the University of North Alabama denying admission to a black student on the basis of race. The University of North Alabama, at the time, was known as Florence State College, and for context for our non-local listeners, it's about an hour west of my house, uh, near Muscle Shoals, which I know some music fans may be familiar with. UNA denied admission to Wendell Gunn, a black applicant, based solely on his race. Gunn filed suit in federal court, and a judge forced the university to admit Mr. Gunn for the fall term. He faced such widespread hostility and harassment that the university had to hold a special after-hours enrollment session for him after the white students had left campus. July 31, 1999, the Great Shipyard Strike of 1999 ended after steelworkers at Newport News Shipbuilding ratified a breakthrough agreement that nearly doubled their pensions, increased security, ended some inequality, and provided the highest wage increases in company and industry history to nearly 10,000 workers at the yard. Came after a 15-week strike. And wrapping up with some sports. July 31st, 1970, 
Members of the National Football League Players Association began what is to be a two-day strike and their first strike in their history. The issues were pay, pensions, the right to arbitration, and the right to have agents. Also on July 31st, but in 1981, 50-day baseball strike came to an end. And if you're interested in the intersection of sports and labor, be sure to tune in to our overtime conversation with Dave Zirin that we had on July 8th. Dave Zirin is, uh, of course, a prolific author of sports and politics, and he has a new show on the Real News Network and is also the sports editor for The Nation magazine. So that's it, folks, for July Labor History. Uh, as we wrap up here, I did want to mention a couple of really good uh, events being held by Labor Notes. They do have their Secrets of a Successful Organizer July workshop series. Uh, July 12th was the first one, so if you missed that one, there are still two more sessions, July 19th and 26th. And again, you can go to labornotes.org to find out more. Really encourage folks to do that. Check out the events that Labor Notes hosts. It's always worth your time uh, and always low to no cost. And also wanted to mention that uh, Jacob was on America's Workforce Union Radio last week on July 5th. And I was on America's Workforce Radio yesterday, July 12th. Uh, we are big fans of America's Workforce. It's a daily union talk radio show based up in Ohio. Uh, Ed Flash Ferentz, the host, has, has been a guest on the show as well, uh, and we have been frequent guests on his show and really appreciate that collaboration. So definitely check that out when you get a chance. All right, y'all, that's it for today's episode of Shop Talk. I uh, hope it was worth your time and I really appreciate everyone listening. If you did enjoy it, please share it with your network and make sure that you're plugged into our work. Uh, just a reminder that the Valley Labor Report is a working class media collective dedicated to lifting up labor struggles throughout Alabama and across the South. We bring you Alabama's only union talk radio show every Saturday morning with the first half from 9.30 to 11 a.m. live Central Time on FM radio through WVNN here in the Huntsville listening area. The entire program is online via Facebook, YouTube, and podcasts. And portions of the program are replayed on WZZA in the Shoals and WHIV out of New Orleans. We do encourage you to check out our website, tvlr.fm, which we... Uh, used to publish articles, news, commentary, clip write-ups. Uh, you can sign up for our email newsletter while you're there so you can stay in touch with what we're doing on the website. Uh, and you can also check out our merch at tvlr.fm slash store. We have some cool shirts right now, and we've got a new Join a Union or the Boss Will Get You design that's coming out very soon. And finally, we rely on donations and sponsorships to put out all of this free content. We appreciate the local unions and organizations that have sponsored ads on our main Saturday show, as well as Labor Notes sponsoring Shop Talk. Please hit us up if you have ideas for sponsors or if you're interested in your organization becoming a sponsor of the show. Our single biggest source of contributions comes from listener donations. You can make a one-time donation or a recurring contribution at tvlr.fm slash donate. We also have a Patreon if you prefer to donate that way. And, of course, we'll take a good old-fashioned check mailed to our P.O. box here in Huntsville. Whether you donate, share, subscribe, or just listen, we do appreciate your support, and we can't do it without you. And so if you share our mission to grow the Southern Labor Movement, if you share our belief in the power of solidarity and collective organization, if you want media that is for working people, by working people, please consider becoming a recurring donor at tvlr.fm donate. All power to the workers. Solidarity, y'all. <laughs>